everyone, and welcome to Pathfinder, presented by Payload, the leading digital media company in the space industry. I'm your host, Mo Islam, and today we're joined by Tabor McCallum and Jane Pointer, the co-founders of Space Perspective. Space Perspective is developing a balloon-based space tourism vehicle to offer rides to around 20 miles above Earth's surface, high enough to see the world's curvature and the blackness of space. They've already had quite a bit of commercial traction and most recently raised a $40 million Series A led by Prime Movers Lab. A lot to discuss, but first a word from our sponsors. Spider Oak's Orbit Secure software is designed for hybrid space operators struggling to manage the chaos of securing data flow and access to and from tens of thousands of small satellites in low Earth orbit. Using a unique combination of end-to-end zero-trust encryption and blockchain distributed ledger, Orbit Secure allows your mission to orchestrate and secure Earth-to-orbit, orbit-to-Earth transmission, communication, and storage of sensitive data across even the most complex and unsecure hybrid space environments. To learn how Orbit Secure can bring zero-trust security and resiliency to your zero-gravity environments, check out SpiderOak at www.spideroak.com. Tabor, Jane, thank you for being on the show. It's a pleasure to have you both. Well, it is our pleasure. Welcome to Space Perspective. Yes. So, uh, for the listeners who might who uh, who can't see, I'm actually sitting here at HQ in uh, the Cape Canaveral area in Florida. Um, I had a chance to spend uh, yesterday with Tabor and Jane at the Axiom AX2 launch, so we got to see a launch together, which was exciting. Yeah, no, it was really cool. So I loved that there was an enormous amount of diversity in uh, the humanity that was on that on the on dragon castle right i mean that was really cool it it is always incredibly impressive to see a rocket launch i'm always reminded of the extraordinary energy that it was a really loud launch there was something about the setup it it was the loud it was even louder than any shuttle launch i've ever heard yeah so how what, what what number of launch was this for you 20? I don't know. 20, I've seen okay. a lot. And I, I may be exaggerating. But. Yeah, roughly that, too. We Living on the Space Coast, we get to see this a lot. But with people, is rare. Yes. And that's really, really special. Uh, uh, so it's always exciting to, to see a human launch. Yeah, and I think we were, we were actually just talking about this before we started the recording, which was um, how, uh, you know, uh, or I was saying how interestingly emotional this particular launch was because it was it sent to Saudi astronauts to space um and the families were all there and mm-hmm. it was very exciting to kind of see what it meant for them and it was also um uh you know it was a female astronaut that was sent to yeah. the iss as well so a lot of you know very exciting milestones that were hit yesterday but uh we're here today to talk about space perspective so thank you guys for the tour i spent about four to five hours with the with the team today so i got, got a chance to really do a deep dive and excited to, to to talk um a bit about the business and what you guys are building so maybe tell us the level set like what is space perspective and what is your mission and what are you trying to achieve so we are uh really wanting to take as many people as possible unprecedented numbers of people to space to have that really quintessential astronaut experience of seeing our planet in that context, right? When you listen to astronauts talking about this experience, it, it's not just a pretty view they're seeing. It, it really moves them. Uh, you might even say it is transformational. And many of them come back from space, not only having just it's, it's a memory that will last with them for their entire lives. It actually changes them. They come back and get more involved in solving our planetary challenges than before they left. So, you know, our mission is to take as many people as possible and really bring more and more people into the space family uh, to take them all to space. So they really have this incredibly visceral experience of being a singular human family yep. inhabiting Spaceship Earth. So talk, tell us a little bit about how... What is the experience, and what is the propo- what is the proposed experience? What is it going to be like for someone to 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 go to space with space perspective? So we're building a pressurized capsule that uh, contains our space lounge. We've set up the interior to be very inviting, uh, to be sort of luxurious enough that people feel secure and comfortable. We've had a lot of people look at our interior renderings and say, "Oh, I could do that." When they didn't like so sort of the classic spacecraft interior. Uh, We launched this capsule under a very large balloon. So we ascend to about 100,000 feet at a blazing 12 miles an hour. Uh, So it takes a couple of hours to get to about 20 miles up. 
uh, at 20 miles, you're above 99% of the atmosphere. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, you can see the curvature of the Earth and the thin blue line of the Earth's atmosphere and about 450 miles in any direction. So you can really get that space experience without the barriers of a rocket launch and the financial barriers of going uh, on a rocket. So the whole idea is to provide that space experience in a very accessible way. Right. We then descend under the balloon and splash down uh, in the ocean uh, where we're picked up very much like the way a SpaceX Dragon capsule is picked up out of the water and put on the deck of a ship uh, to bring people back to shore. So uh, why was it so important for you to solve the uh, rocket part of tourism? Why do you feel like that's such a barrier? So, Well, so it's a massive barrier because... You know, when you talk to people about space that aren't really truly within the space community, it's something that's for other people to do, right? I mean, space has really, especially in America, and I think echoed around the world, you know, there, there's movies called The Right Stuff for a reason, right? It is, it, it, people think you have to really be have special material in your character to go to space and you've got to withstand all of this incredible activity of going to space mm-hmm. because it is not for the mild of all. I mean, right. like it's four or five G's. Yeah. It's, you know, perceived or actual risk. It's still seen as a dangerous thing to do. Uh, and that creates market barriers. Right? Yeah, yeah. And so we really wanted to reimagine space. Right. And that's every aspect of it. That's how we get there, the, the actual experience, the, that the people can imagine themselves doing it. So right. the first thing was to come up with a way to go to space that is very gentle. And that's the space balloon. That's what that affords for us. And then it was to completely reimagine the experience inside the spaceship So it's no longer that sort of stark white interior, very utilitarian. It is, as Tabor said, a space lounge. We have a bar and we have a loo and we have the largest windows ever flown to space. Right. Right? So it's this very casual, relaxed environment, which is like the opposite of what you think space flight is. And, And at the same time, we're fulfilling people's dreams. It's amazing how many people have had that dream of going to space. And people will say... Ever since I was a child, I wanted to go to space. And then I, you know, they, the life never happened, right? right. And then, or they never imagined that they could actually go because yeah. there were so many barriers for them. Right. Or they want to go with their spouse, but their spouse doesn't really want to take the risk. Or there's all these sort of barriers. Right. Or they want to take their friends and family. And so we eliminate so many of those barriers. Almost half of our tickets are people who've bought an entire capsule to take their friends or family with. Right. 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 It's a... It's a group event yeah. that people can share. So you've touched on a couple of things that we're going to hit on. So obviously commercial traction and and and, and safety, uh, yeah. which I know is a huge part of it. But before Absolutely. we get into that, can you tell us? So you two have worked together for a long time. Oh, yeah. You're also married. Like 35 <laughs> yes. years or and, something. And you have a number of uh, very interesting shared experiences, both as entrepreneurs, as operators, Tell us, uh, maybe let's let's start from the beginning, like arc of uh, what you've done and how no, that's I led to baby. you. <laughs> you. We can start. We can we can we can start <laughs> far back. No, we can no, start no. Back as far back as you'd like. Uh, but what 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 really uh, has has evolved and shaped your experience to now running and building space perspective? Uh, well, so there's several beats in that. One of the important beats is that my father was an astronomer. And he used these huge NASA balloons to take instruments to the edge of space. And so growing up, I saw huge telescopes being launched into space on these huge space balloons. And so that was always one of those things in my mind as a way to get to the edge of space. Uh, Then... Uh, from there, we, uh, well, the first, we were on a ship together. Yeah, so it was really interesting being out, out at sea because when you're out at sea, we sailed on a research boat. Tabor sailed almost around the world. I was on it for a year. One of the big trips we did was from Sri Lanka across the Indian Ocean and up the Red Sea. And you're out, you're out in the middle of the ocean, all right? And, and we all know we live on a planet, but do we really know we live on a planet? <laughs> Right? I mean, you yeah. don't really feel it in your bones. Yes, that's does. Right? So out in the middle of the ocean, 
kept seeing this cloud going across the sky every night. And, you know, one of my crewmates kept commenting about it. And all of a sudden I realized, no, 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 you're looking at the Milky Way galaxy. You know, the sky is so big. Everything is so big and you really get the sense that we are all connected. And that was sort of my really my first experience of, holy cow, we live on a planet hurtling through space. Mm-hmm. So we then got involved in this project called Biosphere 2. We were actually on, on the ship. We were part of the training program for right. going into but, Biosphere. Right. The other thing to think about the ship is that you're going 10 miles an hour. <laughs> yeah. six miles That's an hilarious. Hour. Yeah. We are. And we so were. when you see how quickly you move around the globe at 10 miles an hour, you really get a sense where, you know, things aren't that far apart, really, Yeah. Uh, when you're sort of slowly moving around the planet. And that sort of was context. That ship uh, actually was part of a series of projects that uh, included Bias for Two. And so we were both recruited to go to uh, be part of the design team uh, and eventually crew members in Bias for Two. So, so, so before we jump into Biosphere, maybe could you define what is a biosphere for the for the layman? Yeah, so that was actually a really interesting question. So when we were doing Biosphere 2, so we, as Terry said, we were on the design team. Biosphere 1 is planet Earth, right? And normally one thinks of the biosphere, like I think if you look it up in the dictionary, it might say something as simple as the sphere of life around the planet. Mm-hmm. But if you're going to create a biosphere, you have to have something a little more than that. So right. what does it actually mean to be in a biosphere? So we defined it. You're going to have to help me here in case I've forgotten. So we defined it back then as materially enclosed. So right? gravity does that for Earth. Yep. Right. Energetically, uh, energetically open. And so planet Earth has piles of sun coming in. We have a lot of energy going back out. Right. Yep. So a lot of energy, um, complex life system. Yes, and complexity was defined as having several different types of ecosystems. So we had a desert, a savanna, a rainforest, agriculture, and a human habitat. So that gave us a range of different ecosystem types. And so that's what, in our working definition, uh, took it to the level of a biosphere. Now, the funny thing about the biosphere then in the late 80s, early 90s, is we were spelling the word biosphere down the phone for all that period of time. That idea that we live in a self-sustaining ecosystem where everything is recycled and it has balancing mechanisms in it. That idea was nowhere in the popular lexicon. We were defining biosphere and spelling it over and over and over again. And I think Biosphere 2 Project really helped get that idea into the lexicon. The newspapers were saying how photosynthesis works just to explain what was going on in Biosphere 2. Right. So you worked on the Biosphere Project, um, and then what sort of came after? So, so, so what? So we went. In, I went into Biosphere Two thinking that was the closest I was ever going to Mars. Yeah. And the experience we really had in there actually made us sort of really realize that an astronaut experience is really important to be able to give to people because right. when astronauts go to space, you know, they have the overview effect and. Well, everything that comes with that. And we really you had to find really quickly the overview effect. Well, so the overview effect or what we call the space perspective, that's right. really what we're giving people when we take them to space. Right. right. So, so what typically happens when people go to space and they see for the very first time our planet in the context of, you know, the barrier around the planet, that very tenuously thin blue line that is our atmosphere, Mm -hmm. that is what stands between us and this massive vacuum we call space. And there's no life out there yet as far as we know, right? But at least certainly not anywhere near. Um, and, And so when they see that and they realize, wow, all of human history happened down there, and that's this living system that we all rely on, and holy cow, look, there, there's Florida, and I know exactly how big that is. Or, oh, there's my ranch where I grew up, and I certainly know how big that is. The planet is not very big. Right. And you don't see any borders from up there. You don't see any of that, right? right. So it also so it tends to make people kind of think much more cohesively about humanity. So like a singular human species inhabiting spaceship Earth. Mm-hmm. It's sort of the, in some ways, how people think about it when they come back from space. Uh, and so... That is actually a very similar experience that we had in Biosphere 2 from a very different point of view, right? So we went into the Biosphere and 
We knew that everything that we were breathing was all the oxygen was coming from the plants around us. As we were breathing out, we were growing our food from the CO2 we were exhaling. We could see the edges of our world, the glass and steel structure. And the biosphere at the time was sealed tighter than the International Space Station. So it was really tight. How, How big was this? Three acres. Oh, wow. Yeah, six million cubic feet. Right, and how, yeah. many, how many how many people were living? Eight of us. Eight. eight. Wow. Yeah. That's pretty. Yeah, yeah so, so eight of us all recycling our waste, growing our food. We right. drank the same water over and over again. We right. breathed the same oxygen over and over again. We right. were in our own little bubble. It was actually, it was, it was, that was the perspective. And then when we came out, we got a helicopter ride to go over the biosphere so we could see down and you could cover our entire biosphere world just by outstretching your hand right and so that same perspective that astronauts talk about of seeing their whole world we got from this experience of the biosphere and the value of that space perspective as a product is really sort of what's propelling us to do this and so then so then we actually started a company called paragon space development corporation from inside the biosphere with grant anderson who runs the company today doing a fabulous job he's our third founder and, you know, that the sort of the North Star of the company when we started it was, oh, we're going to be the company that doesn't necessarily take us all to Mars, yeah. but helps us be happy and healthy living on Mars. So it's life support systems and solving really difficult technical problems. So so before you started Paragon, after you st- left the biosphere. Oh, no, we, we started Paragon from inside the biosphere. From inside the biosphere. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So, so, uh, so well, uh, let me ask the question differently. As you're helicoptering over the biosphere and you're thinking... Like wow, I can cover it with my hand. Like how amazing but fragile that mm-hmm. is, right? Was it in your mind that like did the, conceptually was space was a concept like space perspective even in your in your sort of uh, line of sight? Well, at the certainly time, not a space it, balloon. No, okay, it took us it. a long time to figure out the space balloon. I see. Okay, so, got so it. the idea of commercially developing space was, and that life support and sort of extreme environments of space and dealing with that was something that we could take what we learned in Biosphere 2 of self-sustaining systems, and that's a product line that anybody developing space will need. So right. uh, so that then sort of began to merge with the growing commercial space line. And you know, there'd been commercial space attempts well before Biosphere 2. Uh, so it was sort of in that line of commercial space. Uh, and then that's when we began to put together as the X Prize started space tourism, we saw the barriers that were inherent in suborbital space tourism of the perceived risk of rockets, the expense, uh, you know, just the extreme velocities. It, it, it created so many barriers. That's sort of what brought us to put together the Bias for Two experience, uh, the ballooning experience, our experience at sea of sort of getting to get the size of the earth uh, really gelled at that point to uh, create an alternative, more accessible way for people to have that quintessential astronaut experience or that space perspective. Right. Okay. So, so, so you, you're, you're now at the point where, you know, you've, you've figured out and you've understood that the best way for everyone to experience this isn't a, you know, jarring, you know, strap yourself to a rocket, i.e. a bomb, and launch yourself at four to six Gs, it's maybe doing something a little bit more. Uh, uh, I think what they're doing is totally cool. Yeah. There's a market for that. For sure. Absolutely. For sure. So I'm not my, saying. My parents aren't going to do that. <laughs> Let's put it that way. No, I mean, that's, sure. that's right. So, so yeah. we, we wanted your parents to go to space. Right. Uh, which I appreciate. <laughs> I, don't, I, don't, I don't know if they would still do that. And you to go with them. <laughs> yeah. uh, so, so let's talk a little bit about um, safety, right? Because yeah. n- nothing is without risk. Um, and, you know, this is a hydrogen powered balloon that's going up well over how many feet? 100,000. 100,000 feet. Yep. Right. So talk, talk a little bit about how you think about safety. Um, and as you're building the the, comp- the business now and, yep. and finalizing the design and the development, like what are sort of the things that are top of mind for you? Oh, yeah. So I'll let you talk about it in detail. Let me just kind of break it down at, at a very high level because Tabor bless his heart will get all technical on us and I'll, I'll be, I'll be very high level. Um, and then, <laughs> yeah. so if you think about spaceship Neptune, let's talk about the tech first, mm-hmm. right? 
uh, that's that's the first thing is you just design it well for safety and you start out with technology that it's got strong legacy. So the space balloon itself, it is the kind of balloon that has been flown by NASA, European Space Agency, our team members over a thousand times successfully without any problems. Mm-hmm. And it, it, so it's really well understood technology. Mm-hmm. That's the primary uh, flight system. Yep. And it goes up under the balloon and it comes down under the balloon. So it's also a very simple flight profile. We don't transition at any point during the flight from one flight system to another flight system. Because whenever you have complexity like that, you have a massive pathway for risk. So we've eliminated that as well. So your primary flight system, pretty darn safe. And we can talk about the hydrogen in a minute because I know you want to. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Um, Then between the balloon and the capsule is a series of four parachutes. So you got redundancy within the parachutes, and those are only ever used in a backup scenario. Uh, and they're also the kind of parachutes that have been used thousands of times without fail. So, so let me let me let's talk about that ba- backup scenario real quick because I was asking you about this earlier. So um, you know, a bird flies through the balloon, or I don't know, someone, some bad actor decides to shoot it, right? Yep. Like um, uh, maybe talk a little bit about how. Uh, you know, resilient the architecture of the balloon is, maybe one, but in like in sort of that that sort of outlier scenario yeah, yeah. where the how the parachutes come into yep. come to play. Sure. So um to give a sense of scale, you can take a small football stadium and spin it inside this balloon. And you know, the the exterior surface of the balloon is over seven acres of surface area. So a hole the size of a basketball really doesn't make that big a difference. Nothing happens that fast. You right? actually probably wouldn't even notice it. So it, it uh, to come down, we open up valves about the size of a table, and that takes about an hour to get enough gas out in order to start gently descending down. So mm-hmm. the, uh, the grace of the balloons is that uh, if a bird were to be able to fly fast enough to somehow make a hole right. in this balloon ascending at 12 miles an hour, um, it, we're not going to suddenly have sort of everything pop. It's not under pressure. Uh, it's a it's a very robust architecture uh, in the balloon itself. Um, so then, well, we have to say to ourselves, there's no way we can say that nothing will ever, ever happen to the balloon. Right? Right. So we just... We, we have to start from the premise that something might happen one day, who knows what. So that's where the parachutes come in. Mm-hmm. Um, they are a series of four uh, parachutes that are designed themselves to be very uh, reliable. They're based around a military cargo chute architecture. Uh, we have four parachutes, but need three. So uh, even within the parachute system itself, we're carrying a lot of redundancy and robustness. And that's just a way, if something were to happen to the balloon, we could get off the balloon and come down under parachutes. All of that uh, is made safer by always flying over water. Right. So we don't have to, with a parachute, get to a landing site Mm -hmm. or transition to trying to fly to a runway. The water's always there. It's really hard to miss the ocean. Right. And so uh, by combining those two aspects, we get to a, a really high level of safety. So then the question is, what about hydrogen? Well, we're not using helium simply because it just isn't available. And it turns out that hydrogen's been in use in human flight in sports, sport ballooning since the 1700s. And if you look at every hydrogen balloon flight that's been done, balloon, not mm-hmm. airship, uh, and there's thousands and thousands of them. Sport balloonists fly thousands of flights every year. There's never been a single accident attributed to hydrogen. Wow. In yeah. the entire history of ballooning. And on these big, huge balloons that are used for science, uh, the Indians and the French all have used hydrogen since the 60s uh, to fly balloons. So the methods of safely using hydrogen are very well established And so we're not breaking new ground on using hydrogen. It's just people uh, always think about the Hindenburg. The crazy thing about the Hindenburg was it was doped in flammable material, and that's actually what caught fire. Uh, And the hydrogen was simply a byproduct of of the fire. So that's an 80-year-old airship that was designed for helium, not for hydrogen. So it's really not sort of irrelevant outside of 
the marketing branding. Yeah, poor side hydrogen. Of this. It has yeah. a very sad branding problem. It has to overcome with the Hindenburg because it really isn't. It really is completely irrelevant for what we're doing. We could definitely dive down a rabbit hole for all yeah. the technical reasons why that particular airship should never yeah. have had hydrogen in it because it also allowed the hydrogen to mix with air within a very enclosed environment. Yeah, which then caused a, a flammable gas. I see. Fascinating. Yeah. Uh, Tabor, Jane, um, we're going to take a very quick break. And I know we haven't even gotten to the good stuff yet because we want to talk about the market and and all your commercial traction so far. Um, So just uh, bear with us uh, one second. We'll be right back. Space is the new frontier for cybersecurity. To quote the commander of the U.S. Space Forces Operations Command, cyber threats are unfortunately the soft underbelly of our global space networks. Spider Oak, the leader in space cybersecurity software, is dedicated to providing space operators with the solutions they need to protect hybrid space systems. Their Orbit Secure software uses a unique combination of end to end zero trust encryption and blockchain distributed ledger, allowing missions to orchestrate and secure Earth to orbit, orbit to Earth transmission, communication, and storage of sensitive data across even the most complex and unsecure LEO and hybrid space systems. To learn how Orbit Secure can bring zero trust security and resiliency to your zero gravity environments, check out Spider Oak at www.spideroak.com. Jane, Tabor, welcome back. Um, so I know we've spent uh, a little bit of time on on the safety features, but I do really want to talk about um, you know the folks that have expressed interest in wanting yeah. to fly to space. So. Uh, let's really quickly talk about um, who are you targeting initially, right? Who are wh- what is the initial target market, um, target customer base look like? Maybe let's talk about like profiles, like um, mm-hmm. you know, a pricing. If you can you talk yeah. a little bit oh, about no, that, course. love to. Um, and then you know, we can talk about where it is today versus where we think it's going to go over the next you know five to ten years. Because yeah, obviously. These things, all these type, these types of technologies, always start off a, a little bit more expensive than it, you know, than you know for the mainstream. But over time, the hope is that you know that continues to come down substantially. So uh, maybe let's t- start with you know who is the target market today? Well, maybe we should talk start with kind of like who the the, the ticket price and that kind of yeah thing yeah let's because, do that because then it'll let's do that. Uh, reveal who our target market is to sure. a degree, right? Sure. So, um, so our ticket price is one hundred and twenty-five thousand dollars, and we thought long and hard about what it should be, right? Uh, so, at the time we came out with our tickets a couple of years ago, Virgin was two hundred and fifty, uh, and actually, if you're too much lower than other people in your market, uh, you people are kind of like, huh? Yeah. What's going on here? Why are you so inexpensive? So we wanted to be around half the price from them. Uh, then that also, if we would, so, so we compare ourselves to other space companies, but also we think a lot about what are the alternate experiences that people can have. So you could almost think of it as you know, like the the luxury safari or somebody wanting to go to Antarctic or any of those kinds of incredible experiences. But now people can sit around their dining room table in the evening and think about, oh, let's go to space. So we wanted to price it right in that region, which is is exactly where it is. So $125,000 just sits neatly in that market too. So clearly our initial customers are high net worth individuals, right? Uh, And our customers right now, we're sort of, you might say, in the early adopter phase, although I will say we're beginning to get sort of more of our target market earlier on than I even expected. You know, so early adopters are are people that have dreamt their entire lives of going to space, right? They're total space geeks. They like go to Axiom launches. (laughs) We have a small group of customers that have tickets on everything. They've got a ticket for Virgin Galactic. They've been on Blue Origin twice or about to be on Blue Origin twice, right? Mm -hmm. So so there's a small cohort of people that are super early adopters and we love them for it. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, then there's the people who sort of the people who have bucket lists, the, the people who maybe never really thought they could go to space. They, they'd always thought about how cool it would be to go to space. But we have a lot of customers who are like, I, I just never thought I was going to be able to do this in my lifetime, which is super cool because that also means we have helped lower the barriers. And it's not just financially, it is experientially. So that, that's also cool. And then, you know, eventually we, we want to reach the, the people who right now need to see other people having flown and, and seen it a little bit. And those are all the people that are doing those luxury travel 
uh, uh, adventures, if you will. And uh, we're already seeing seeing those people come to us. 80% of our customers right now are from America. That's mostly because of awareness. Right. right? Almost nobody's heard of us yet. Yeah. So can you can you share a little bit of data of how many folks have signed up so far? Or have oh, yeah. Interest, so, or how are so you measuring that? Super, super exciting. So uh, we have almost 1,300 people uh, have bought tickets. Uh, so so that's a, a really awesome backlog, right? So right. we're at about 180 million backlog or something in that region. Um, and so right now people put down a deposit. So anywhere from $1,000 to $60,000, depending on where you want to fly right. uh, in the in the sort of where you want to be in the, the list of flyers. Yeah. So um, obviously, if you want to fly sooner, you pay a little more than if you're willing to wait a little longer. The ticket price is all the same at the moment, though that's going to change. Right. So um, what is the current um, plan for the first kind of commercial flight? Yeah, around the end of 24. Okay. So so Tabor's under the gun because uh, and all of his his team uh, because we're getting into flights this summer, which is going to be super exciting. We had test flight uh, not too long about just over a year ago uh, with an unpressurized uh, capsule, and then we're getting into really this like ongoing test flight program with a fully pressurized cap- like the capsule that we'll all be flying in just uh, won't have all the fancy interior and it'll be all instrumented. Right. And then um, is uh, what what do you th- I guess, like, how long do you think it's going to take to even get through the initial backlog? Because it feels like, you know, there's quite a bit of demand there. there. Uh, yeah, I, I sort of feel like we're never going to get through the backlog because as we start to fly with people, yeah, it's just going to grow. I mean, the the total addressable market by different folks is orbits around, you know, half a trillion dollars. Right. Right. Uh, it's it's a huge market, and I think we're going to be operationally constrained for a long time. Right. So um, uh, one thing I'm, I was a little curious about, and I actually hadn't had a chance to ask you today, which was around uh, weightlessness. Mm-hmm. Right? When, when people think about going to space, they think yes. about weightlessness. Now, um, you don't experience that as part of no. space perspectives. Um, is that something that you think is... Um, is maybe not as important to folks? Or? I think actually zero gravity for a lot of people is a barrier. Oh, interesting. Yeah, I know it, it's a little surprising for us who are really excited in the industry. And look, and yeah. I've, I've done a lot of parabolas and I think it's really fun, but it is not for everyone. Every flight I've been on, there's been that poor soul sitting in the back of the plane, just like with their head down, looking extremely green. Yeah. So it, it is very disorienting for some people. So we actually think it's a great thing that we don't have zero G on this flight because after all you get to go stand at the bar and look out at space yes and then you can do your zero G flight separately so we're really sort of separating the experience so you can really focus on that view out the window and that's actually it's so interesting when you talk to people uh who you say okay what advice would you have for other people going to space they're all they all say Forget all that flipping around. Go to the window and look out the window. That's what you should focus on. So uh, you mentioned people feeling green, and it makes me think of like you know, let's just take something uh, like a roller coaster, right? Yeah. Sometimes you can convince your friend, or your cousin, or whoever to to go on that roller coaster with you, and then the second they're on it, they're like freaking out. They're yeah. like, right, "Get me off this!" Yeah. Right? So uh, when someone uh, you know you envision getting on yeah. you know the balloon, very excited, and then you know people, we're all human. Sometimes folks get scared or anxious or whatever. What, whatever um, may happen in those scenarios, right? How do you allow folks to deal with that maybe initial jarring experience where mm. someone may have never mm. been up that high or seen and you know, all of a sudden they're looking out and they're like, oh, wait a minute, I can't handle this. Yeah, right? no, so I think it's A couple of things. The, the, uh, the captain on board is obviously, I think, one of the main trainings that person and skills that person has to have is keeping people calm. Yep. Uh, we've also designed our laboratory, which is actually now our space spa. Mm-hmm. I don't think we've actually said that publicly. It's a space spa. Mm-hmm. It's, the design is coming along. It's absolutely wild. It's great. Um, but we're setting it up so that you can put a blind over the windows, close the door, and not see the outside inside that room. So if somebody is really having a hard time, you can set them in there and just you know let them 
chill. And so we're, we're thinking through how we work with that issue and create a space in the capsule to help people relax, recenter, and then, you know, come back out and enjoy. Yeah. I think it's also incumbent on us to really prepare people. You know, we don't have, n- nobody really needs training. To come right. On this, right. I right. mean, it's going to be a glorified safety brief. Uh, but, but I do think people need preparation, you know, and that's not only the preparation sort of mentally to really make the most of this incredible gift of seeing our planet from that vantage point, but, but like that, as you're talking about, you know, you don't want people, everybody that I've spoken to says people need to know what to experience, what they're going to experience. And that then really takes care of most of this. Right. I think there's some things, uh, we have a VR experience that uh, we use. We used initially for design purposes, and now to sort of give a flavor of that. So I think helping people get a sense of what the experience is like using VR ahead of time uh, is also a, a really important way for people to understand what that experience is going to be like. Right now, um, uh, will folks be able to launch? Are you planning on launching from anywhere? What, what's, mm-hmm. what is the current plan in terms of like? where these balloons will launch from initially, what, what can kind of prospective customers expect? So the initial launch will be from a marine spaceport. Uh, we are building a ship that can launch these space balloons and the capsules uh, from sea. So we launch from sea and recover at sea. Uh, we are also looking at Kennedy Space Center. And we have an operations center there uh, and launching from Kennedy Space Center as we develop the operations. But the mainstay of the business model is really built around ocean launch and ocean recovery so that we have really full control of that operating model and we can reproduce it and we're not tied to having to find new spaceports in every country we want to expand to. So when we really dug into uh, marine operations, splashing down was a huge increase in safety. Mm -hmm. So that became necessary just to close the safety model and then launching from the ocean allowed us to have a reproducible operation that we can then take to the Mediterranean and the Middle East and Singapore and Japan and all around. All we need to do is take people outside the territorial waters and we are regulated by the FAA in the U.S. as a space launch. So we will always be regulated by the FAA no matter where we are as part of the Outer Space Treaty. Uh, So we have a regulatory regime that applies to us worldwide and a way to scale and grow very rapidly without having to have infrastructure in locations around the world. So I, so, so if I can just piggyback on that a minute, I think what's super interesting also from an experience point of view uh, is, you know, we think about repeat flights, right? So we already have customers that have bought more than one capsule. I mean, 50% of our tickets have been bought as full flights. And they go with their friends on one flight and they go with their family on another flight. So you've already got repeat flights. But now imagine that you're flying from different locations around the world. Okay, so you could say, well, doesn't space look the same everywhere? Yeah, I guess it kind of does. Sure. But what you're looking at out the window does not. And certainly the pre and post is completely different. So when astronauts talk about what's really profound is seeing something you recognize from space. So, of course, Americans are going to absolutely recognize Florida. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Not everybody from around the world is necessarily going to actually feel some kind of bond with Florida. But now, you know, if you're looking down on the pyramids or you're looking at the boot of Italy or... Or Japan or exactly. Indonesian islands so we can fly where people know how big and what they have a connection to that piece of land that we're flying over, I think is a huge impact on making the experience tie personally for them. Uh, and so, uh, and also, you know, imagine seeing, you know, the Northern Lights uh, from the edge of space. You know, we can, we can craft and tailor these flights amazingly well without fundamentally changing the operation. Yeah, and then also one last thing, and I'll let you, you talk more. <laughs> so, so also imagine the pre and post. So when we're flying from Florida, uh, you know, it, it's, it's going to feel a lot like, you know, where the history of human spaceflight has been forged, yes. right? It's going to have very much that flavor. But now imagine you're flying from somewhere completely different. You're in Southeast Asia. I mean, that is going to feel the pre and post, the whole feel of it, the whole vibe of it is going to just be completely different, which is also very exciting. Um, 
Uh, just going back to one thing I'm more cur- I'm curious about, the, the launching from a ship. Are there um, weather-related reasons why that's advantageous? Yes, there are. Thank you. Thank you for that lead-in, Mo. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, that was not planned. <laughs> uh, so in launching these huge balloons, uh, two of the critical things are the speed over the balloon as you're inflating and launching the balloon and the direction of the wind. Uh, so a ship can, in essence, control the weather. We can align the ship's vector with the wind. So we always have wind going over the deck in the direction that we want it to be. And then the ship can take away a huge amount of the wind simply by going with the wind. So uh, this actually opens up dramatically the range of weather conditions in which we can operate by being able to, in essence, control the weather. And then um, uh, on the regulatory side, so you mentioned you mentioned Outer Space Treaty, you mentioned FAA. So right now, what you're saying is that you know once uh, let's just maybe fast forward a year, and you know you have uh, you know you're ready for commercial. Um, uh, 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 to, to kind of commercialize the product, you could theoretically take that ship anywhere in the world. And let's just say you had one particular client who was willing to pay, I don't know, quadruple the price because they really wanted to be the first or second or third customer. Could you theoretically take that all to Southeast Asia and launch them there without any... Absolutely. So, so there are no regulatory... Well, of- so we're regulated yeah. as a space flight. So just like mm-hmm. SpaceX and yeah. Virgin Galactic. Yeah. Uh, and that applies to us no matter where we are in the world. Uh, so we can take that anywhere we want to go. Now, if we are operating from Singapore's land, then we'd be subject to Singapore's regulation. I see. But if we're not operating, if we're just operating in the water off of Singapore... That's where Singapore's regulation no longer applies, and we're only regulated by the FAA. To be very clear, however, (laughs) we do want to maintain good relationships with our host countries. (laughs) So we will be cooperating with our host countries. Absolutely. Absolutely. There's a much easier uh, set of barriers to get through. Right. No, that that makes a a ton of sense. Um, Now... Uh, I do want to ask really quickly. So the, spa- the spaceship is called the spaceship called Neptune. Ne- Neptune, and where did you come up with the name? Ah, so the name has to do with tying sea and space together. So Neptune, the planet, right? Yep. And then, of course, Neptune is the god of the ocean. And one could think that we live on planet Aqua, right? And we also launch from the sea, and we splash in the sea. We're very much an ocean-based company, right? And then, lastly which is completely coincidental, we didn't know before we named the the ship this, Mm -hmm. is that the atmosphere on Neptune is made up almost exclusively of helium and hydrogen, which are the two lift gases that you can use in a a space balloon. So um, is uh, is there a uh, future version of Neptune that maybe is called something different, larger? Yeah, for sure. I'm sure we'll have a bunch of different versions of this let's let's talk a little bit about what the uh maybe long-term vision of the company is right so you clearly have had a tremendous amount of initial um uh commercial success uh clearly product makes sense um and uh, there's a lot of folks who want to try this um have you as as two you know serial entrepreneurs operators uh, I'm sure your mind's also thinking about what's next, right? Even even as you kind of continue along your current trajectory. Yeah, so there's different kinds of what next. So the one kind of what next is uh, kind of different core products, which are the, is the space flight at the moment, right? So uh, fairly easy for us to extend the flight. So you could imagine having overnights or a couple of days uh, up there. I personally would actually like to go around the world. That is not going to be for everyone because it is going to take a few days, but how amazing would that be? Right. Um, and then there's how can we get more people up there at once that also allows us to quite readily bring the price down. And this will be a longer term vision where we make perhaps a bigger capsule where we can fly more people at once. Uh, and that will be coming up in the future at some undisclosed period of time. I mean, we don't need to bring the price down because the the demand is so huge. Uh, but we, you know, at some point we're we're going to want to open this up to as many people as possible. Right. Well, um, I, I have a so, so yesterday at dinner, one of the folks we were at dinner with 
and uh, Tabor, I don't know, I don't think you were listening at this point because I know you were having a separate conversation, but uh, uh, one of the folks at dinner called Jane a pioneer. And I'm curious, um, you know, do you consider yourselves pioneers and why is this technology so important? Because I, and, and, and I, and I want to say from this perspective, right, there is a contingency of folks that are like, oh, space tourism, like, wow, you know, we're focused on other things that are more important. Like, Yeah, but you know why? It's because they do not understand the power of human spaceflight. I mean, it is, and it, it truly is an incredible inspiration engine, right? Yeah. So if you think about, you know, in, in our generation, I mean, Apollo had an incredible impact on especially American society, right? right? I mean, it, it, it inspired two generations of kids to go into STEM uh, careers or even, not even, but just imagine the possible. Right. I mean, imagine if every... A school district in the world had somebody who'd been to the edge of space right. and could relate to six, eight, and 10 year olds what it was like to see the earth in that context and how critically important it is to think globally, to understand your global impact. Just that message and that visceral experience, and then just having a large number of people having that experience and come back and make that. A relatable experience, I think, is tremendously important in, in what we're seeing right now. So, that's your question. I don't know. I'm, I'm not sure. I call myself a pioneer. I, I, there are many threads of history that are coming together in space perspective, and I think we're at a, a very fortunate time. And we've uh, we, we have a team that is just amazing. We have the best of the best in every area, and. Uh, it's really a very humbling experience uh, to have this team and sort of this responsibility. And so uh, I, I think I would use words like humble and grateful uh, more than something else. So I, I don't even think about whether I'm a pioneer or not. I, um, I feel extremely fortunate that I have been able to be a part of some really incredible incredible product projects, right. right? I mean, Biosphere 2 was was really the first incredible project. And then, you know, space really does take on these very ambitious things. And so we've been able to be involved in the shuttle program and the International Space Station program and, you know, all of these things and, you know, going to the products, going to the moon. I mean, these are yeah. just things that uh, are so incredible to be able to be a part of. Also, you know, getting started. So, you know, part of the history we haven't touched on is when we began to really formulate around space tourism. <clears throat> uh, we were introduced by Peter Diamandis to uh, Alan Eustace, and Alan Eustace mm -hmm. wanted to break the human ballooning altitude record and also the skydiving record. Um, and uh, we worked with him on a project called Stratex to break the record, and so we uh, have the record of the highest human flight uh, under a space balloon and also the record for the farthest and fastest descent, a uh, controlled descent. Um, which, by, which, by the way, I must say, I, I found fascinating because that was something that I learned today because when everyone thinks about stratosphere and skydive and space dive, uh, and, uh, most folks that have any familiarity with that might say, oh, well, that's, you know, did that Red Bull guy do it? You yeah. Know, Felix Baumgartner. So I, I, didn't, I didn't even realize that someone had broken the record. So it's <coughs> interesting to see that there is someone out there who had that strong desire, but didn't even really want people to know about it. Not only didn't really want, we actively didn't have press actually we had a single new york times reporter at the final record launch right. just to kind of record it because otherwise it didn't really happen right um <laughs> right. alan really didn't want there to be press he wanted this to be a very pure engineering exercise done as safely as possible uh and you know, alan is on our board now super supportive uh so that uh in the timeline of things having that experience of a human flight and that's to 136,000 feet. I mean, really deep into the stratosphere. Uh, the life support aspect, building a team that you know, is can send somebody that high up and have a responsibility for safety uh, with that team. Now, it's 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 really an awesome part of the history that has got us where we are. Right. And I want to go back to one thing you mentioned on on sort of the uh, the the importance of, of what you're doing. Have you ever watched? Um, uh, Dr. Robert Zubrin's 
speech on why we should go to Mars? I don't know which particular speech you're talking about. Yeah. I mean, we obviously have known Bob Supreme for a long time. Yeah. So, so there's one particular one. If you literally just, I think if you go, you, uh, we'll put it in the show notes. Like if you Google or YouTube, um, why we should go to Mars, Super, mm. and it's like a five minute clip. And I love, like, we love that clip at Payload. We've, we've like Ari and I have told multiple people to go watch mm. this, but I think I'm not going to go through the whole thing, but there's two key things that he talks about, which I find fascinating. Mm. One, which is he says that it's important for us to go to Mars because we, as a society, as a civilization, have always been explorers. And the reason why we continue to progress as a a civilization is that need to go kind of push that extra mile, extra extra boundary. Um, You're here. And, and, uh, you know, he he mentions a really interesting example. He says, you know, you ask most people what happened in 1492 everyone's the first name everyone thinks of is Columbus, right? Now, regardless of, I know that he's become a controversial figure these days, but 1492, you think Columbus. No one thinks about, you know, the Medicis who were the yeah. richest family on earth at the time, or that there was a war going on at the time, I think between the Muslims and the Spanish, but no one talks about that. No one thinks about that. No one remembers that. People remember the word Columbus, right? Everyone remembers that in the future. And that same thing in the future, we're gonna, you know, when we finally do end up landing on Mars, Everyone's going to remember, you know, what we did that year was Mars, not the richest. Who was the richest person in the billionaire space race? Like civilization 500 years from now is not going to care about that, right? They're going to care about those important inflection points, right? That's number one, which I always think is so cool. And number two, which you 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 hit on a little, um, you hit on a bit, which is what it will do for the next generation and like um, folks that uh, the, how it will inspire yeah. the next generation of students to pursue STEM. Right. And pursue those kind of advanced degrees, because we all know we've seen a lot of those surveys like, you know, of the, you know, the younger generation of what do you want to be when you get older? And there's an enormous amount of weight to put on influencer or YouTube influencer or social media influencer. Right. So that has to change. So uh, I do want to say that because I because a number of what you've said, I think, hits on a lot of those points on why you know, something like this is, is actually important. And well, I think so- also, it's also sort of foundational to the whole market. I think we're sort of the gateway drug, right? We're the easy, accessible, we get people excited. We, we have a, a, a person who uh, wants to teach photography to 16-year-olds uh, and take them up and have an experience. So I think we can have many transformative experiences directly flying, young people, but also broadcasting, uh, you know, having people who've had that experience. Uh, you know, one thing that Alan talked a lot about in Stratex was showing people the power of technology and what can be done and what's possible and recalibrating the what's possible. And certainly Apollo mm-hmm. did that. But I think even something, a you know, an edge of space balloon flight is still going to be a fascinating, inspiring experience. No, definitely. Yeah, so we're we're already wanting to take uh, all kinds of different people to space. And so we're developing really in-depth relationships with artists and musicians mm-hmm. and you know, poets and leaders and, you know, all a whole array of people. Right. Uh, because I think it is incredibly important for this experience of our planet in the context of space to not only be experienced in very different ways, but then be communicated in very different ways. You know, when William Shatner went up Mm -hmm. for his 10 minute flight, you know, he he was a very different kind of person really than had flown to space previously. And how he talked about it upon his return was very different than I've heard anyone else talk about it. Yeah. And that was a very short period of time. Now imagine you've got thousands of people from all different walks of life having gone. And with some of whom are going to have enormous reach, some of whom are going to come back and just want to do something amazing with that energy from this flight. Uh, and, and we want to help them. It's not our job to tell them what to do with that energy, but yeah. we can certainly help them, uh, you know, think about things to do with it. You know, we're also, you know, as an experience company, we want to, we want to work with these artists and, and other people that go to, you know, create experiences that live long beyond their space flight and that we can invite other people to be involved in as well. Yeah. You know, it's funny. I remember when, when Shatner landed and he, you know, got out of the capsule and yeah. he was talking to Jeff. 
um, Bezos for uh, like re- pretty much immediate after and how emotional he got. It was yeah. actually really, it was, it, was, it was, it's hard not to feel that emotion. I remember that interview it was very interesting. Um, all right. So just as we wrap up, I do have uh, one uh, question for you that your actual, your team, your social media team asked me actually earlier today Uh-oh. Um, and I didn't have a good answer and they, but they gave me some time to think about it. So, <laughs> but, but I'm sure, but you're not going to give us any time. I'm not to giving you any time because I'm, I'm, right. sure I'm, sure, I'm certain, I'm certain that you guys have thought about this question, which is like, okay, so I'm not going to ask when you're going to go up, but I know you two are definitely going to go up. There's no question in my mind. Who are you taking with you? We're taking well, each, other. Taking uh, well, each well, other. Well, obviously each other, but I'm saying like, who's like, who's, who's in your crew? If you have to choose and let's, let's do something slightly different, which is living or dead. Who would you take with you? If you, you had no restrictions, you could take what we could take whoever you wanted up there. Who are like a few people that you think would be 100% on your list? Oh, oh Hawking would certainly be okay. you know, somebody who gives uh, an, an amazing uh, perspective of things. It would be, it would be amazing to take the Dalai Lama. Mm-hmm. I'd love to take a jazz musician, mm-hmm. you know, somebody who interprets what they're seeing in a musical way uh, and uh, you know, a poet, you know, it would be amazing to take poets. And It'd be great to have them. Amanda Gorman go up. I'd love to hear what she writes. Oh, I would actually fantastic. like to take a flat earther. Oh, that's a great answer. That's a great answer. <laughs> that's a great answer. That's a good one. That's funny. Um, anyone else? Oh my gosh. Uh, I mean, so, so I, I like the idea of taking people from very, very, perhaps even diametrically opposed backgrounds. Right. Uh, so that would be really fun to think about. Um, it'd be fun to take, uh, to do a flight that was, you know, like the hardcore Dems and the hardcore Republicans for <laughs> each, right? Yeah, you know, but- I mean, I think taking world, well, I, I do think I would would really like to take world leaders up. Yeah, I really would. I mean, I, I think that's, I, that's another. Good I, one, yeah. I think I think a lot about you know this, you know, UN Cup twenty eight. Are we at now? And I'm thinking if. People went up who were actually making these decisions and enormously influential on our world, and they really had that context that we are literally a singular human family inhabiting a spaceship. Yeah. We're all hurtling through space on together. Yeah. That these discussions would be a little less acrimonious and a little more collaborative. The, the data isn't working. Right? We've had the data since the mid 80s. Right. The data is on global climate change has been pretty definitive. In 88, it was pretty much stated there really isn't a scientific question about global climate change. So, so, you know, now we're at 30 odd years of having the data. So something else has to come into the equation. And I think adults especially learn through experience. We learn through visceral experiences. Those are the that's the only way to change somebody's perspective on the world is to give them a visceral experience that makes them rethink their place in the world and the responsibility we have to, as you know, Carl Sagan said, you know, treat our planet with respect and treat each other kindly. Um, are reservations still open? Oh, yes, of absolutely. How Come do, to the website. How do people? Yeah, how do people sign up? Spaceperspective.com. All right. Well, you can buy a ticket to space on the internet. There you go. There you go. Um, thank you guys. This is awesome. Uh, I really appreciate the conversation. I really appreciate you having me and uh, very excited to see the uh, continued progress from your team. Mo, there is thank one you. very important thing I didn't say, and okay. that this is carbon neutral. As we were talking about, oh, right. as we were talking about climate change, right? So the, the flight is carbon neutral and we operate the company as a carbon neutral company. Got it. Yeah, so we're a plug in electric carbon neutral zero emission spacecraft. Wow. That's great. We didn't talk about that, but that is an important point. <laughs> yeah, it's actually something that our customers really appreciate. Right. It, it's, a, it's a really big part of the overall uh, product. Right. Well, amazing. Uh, it was lovely to have you both. Thank you um, for all of that. And uh, uh, I am excited to have you guys back on the show once we start commercial flights. And thank you for visiting. This was yes. fun. Yes. It was fun having you a tour. Absolutely. Uh, and highly recommend it. Anyone, any, I don't want to send a, a mob of people to you guys, but you're down here in Cape Canaveral and it's, uh, and it's, uh, it's a great tour, to say the least. 
Thanks. Thanks very much.